So welcome back to everyone. Today we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Rania Kalek, uh, who is a writer, activist uh, and journalist at uh, Breakthrough News. Um, her work uh, has appeared at uh, Common Dreams, Salon, The Nation, In These Crimes, Citizen Radio and more. Uh, I suggest to all of you to visit uh, Rania's website, uh, Dispatches from the Underclass, uh, and of course to follow uh, all their breaking breaking free news videos. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much, uh, Rania, for your work and uh, for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to join you today. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so Rania. I'll start with this one. Um, we are probably witnessing uh, the birth of the largest uh, um, pro-Palestinian popular movement uh, in the history of uh, the United States. Um, so what political uh, characteristic uh, does this movement have? Um, what kind of electorate uh, is part of it? Um, and do you think that uh, um, lots of uh, people from the democratic area are actually changing their mind and their opinion about Israel? Well, those are really, really good questions. And, you know, I would start with the fact that the pro-Palestine movement uh, is certainly larger than it's ever been in the U.S. because people are disgusted and appalled by the depravity of Israeli uh, behavior in Gaza and the fact that the U.S. is just willing to support this genocide at all costs continues to arm Israel with an endless supply, a seemingly endless supply of weapons and giving Israel diplomatic immunity, preventing uh, ceasefires from taking place uh, and just blocking all mechanisms of accountability at this point uh, against this, you know, population in Gaza uh, that's been living in a concentration camp that's now been turned into a death camp. Uh, and so I would say, you know, the pro-Palestine movement in the U.S. has been growing for the past couple of decades. Uh, people have been radicalized on this issue, especially every time there's a, a horrific Israeli campaign in Gaza, uh, whether we're talking about 2008, 2009 with Operation Cast Lead, or the Operation Protective Edge that Israel carried out in Gaza in 2014. It was a 51-day war. Uh, or whether we're talking about the, uh, I think it was two or three weeks, another Operation in Gaza back in 2021. Um, each time these bouts of, of, of Israeli violence take place, people become more radicalized in this issue because they see this sort of live streamed atrocities taking place. In 2023, 2024, this is, of course, reached beyond just a typical Israeli mowing the lawn. And, and we're just witnessing a live stream genocide that's really traumatizing people. So we've seen lots of people become radicalized on this issue, get in the streets, joining organizations. And because there's already this sort of foundational basis around the issue of Palestine that people have been organizing around for, like I said, the past couple of decades, there is an organizational infrastructure that does already exist for people to join into. And in those kinds of organizations, there is a lot of anti-imperialist thought and theory and rhetoric. So people are coming into this, getting radicalized on the issue of Gaza, and then learning about American imperialism. They're learning how this is connected to U.S. wars across the Middle East, whether we're talking about Yemen, which they're seeing Yemen get bombed again now by the U.S. and the U.K., whether we're talking about what took place in Syria prior to this, whether we're talking about the U.S. war on Iraq, um, U.S. war in Afghanistan. I mean, people are starting to understand the significance of what the U.S. does across Latin America and really across the entire global South. So I would say that a political characteristic that I see um, really being um, absorbed by people who are becoming radicalized on this issue and joining this movement in this time are that they're beginning to understand the severity of imperialism because they're seeing the U.S. empire, they're seeing U.S. imperialism with its mask off. What's happening in Gaza is, you know, it, it, are things that the U.S. has been doing around the world. We're just seeing it now and we're seeing it at its most extreme. Um, so I think that that's really important. And when we talk about the electorate in America, I mean, we are coming up on this like, uh, you know, election where it seems like we're going to be having a Trump versus Biden 
situation again. And I think we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But as far as the Democratic Party is concerned, uh, the opinions on Israel-Palestine were changing before this latest genocide. You had Democrats, the Democratic base, increasingly becoming less pro-Israel and more pro-Palestine. And that has shifted even more dramatically since October 7. Um, and, you know, I think that what we're seeing now is a Democratic base that is so disgusted with the Democratic leadership, uh, especially because, you know, Biden is the leader of the Democratic Party and he is refusing to support a ceasefire. There was just a Michigan primary for Biden where about over a little over 13% of voters in the Democratic primary voted uncommitted as a protest against Biden's um, ongoing support for Israel's genocide. And there are many people, and this is a swing state that Biden has to win in order to defeat Trump. Uh, there are many people who, even if Biden supports a ceasefire now, this is, it's too late. This is almost five months of genocide that he has supported without condition. Um, and it's just too many babies being torn to shreds by American weaponry. There's nothing Biden can do to gain back those votes. So I think we are absolutely seeing the Democratic opinion shift. About 50% of Democrats uh, who've been polled are actually calling this a genocide. A majority of Democratic voters uh, support support Palestine and oppose what Israel's doing. Uh, and those numbers are, are very important. We talk about this, the, the sort of sustainability uh, of this Democratic Party coalition uh, moving forward. So opinions are absolutely changing. I think we're seeing a real shift in the con in the consciousness of the American electorate. Uh, and I think that that's been in many ways displayed by um, this like self-immolation of Air uh, by Aaron Bushnell that, that we just witnessed outside the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. Right. I think it's, it's very interesting what you're saying because uh, um, actually, uh, you're saying that that could be a kind of turning point, right? So also for uh, lots of uh, young people to get more closer to the anti-imperialist issues uh, and to the um, uh, foreign uh, American foreign policy. That is something uh, that uh, till now has some difficulties uh, uh, to become uh, uh, prior issues uh, also in the political consciousness a lot of people more concerned in uh, I don't know on um, uh, civil rights uh, and other stuff that of course are important but also I have here in Italy the same uh, the same feeling uh, that that could be finally a turning point to start talking again against um, uh, anti-imperialism uh, and uh, against um, uh, Western suprematism uh, on the world over the world and um, in uh, in this in this in this context uh, and in this movement that uh, you have described. Uh, um, what the uh, Jewish left uh, um, is, uh, what kind of role uh, they are actually playing? So a very important role. The Jewish left um, has been well organized on this issue as well for the last couple of decades. There's been a real radicalization. I mean, everything I said about the sort of radicalization of a particular generation in the U.S. on the issue of Palestine where there has been activism and sort of building of, found uh, of organizations uh, against Israel settler colonialism um, has been taking place uh, for a couple of decades, predominantly on college campuses, but also outside of them. And the Jewish left has played a huge role in that. You have organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace, um, which has really been at the forefront of this issue and at challenging their own community and particularly challenging the sort of more establishment American Jewish organizations that uh, are, you know, very supportive of Zionism and sort of exist to police, not just how the American uh, population speaks or like the American media speaks on this issue or even American politicians, but policing their own community because there's been so much pushback uh, because, you know, Younger Jews are very far removed from the the Holocaust, right? And that is what Zionist organizations in the U.S. have successfully, for decades and decades and decades, weaponized to keep Jewish opinion in line when it comes to the issue of Israel. They use this issue of fear of you're not ever really safe anywhere. You need this other place to continue to exist, regardless of what it means for the native inhabitants. Let's not even talk about them. Because, like, just in case, because the Holocaust happened and that was horrible. But for younger American Jews, um, 
it's increasingly clear that in the U.S. they feel quite safe. Um, you know, Jews have been very much embraced and absorbed into whiteness in the U.S. in a lot of ways. Um, so that anti-Semitism of 50 years ago, while, you know, anti-Semitism still exists, it's not like it was before. Uh, and also, furthermore, most American Jews are quite liberal-leaning, they're quite progressive-leaning, particularly younger American Jews, because that's just the case with the younger generation. And so they support Black Lives Matter. They oppose white supremacy. They're increasingly angry with the ruling class and imperialism and capitalism and all these things that we're all angry about. And they recognize that Israel is a part of this. And so they, you know, the Jewish left has always played a very important role when it comes to anti-Zionism um, and anti-fascism. And they've continued to do that now. And as a result, some of the people being uh, attacked the most in the U.S. on college campuses and off of them are anti-Zionist American Jews on the left. I mean, some of the most vicious rhetoric uh, from Zionist organizations like the ADL or APAC is, in fact, reserved for them. You know, they're not just self-hating, but, you know, they're called like Holocaust deniers. They're just, they're called, they're called traitors. They're called all kinds of things. Um, but they've been, you know, very great allies on this issue. They're super important to this cause. And I think it's also important because at the end of the day, you know, Zionism wants to claim to represent all Jews. It wants to claim that Israel is, is, is acting in the name of Judaism and the Jewish people. And so it's incredibly important that at the forefront on this issue are Jewish people who are like, no, absolutely not. Not in my name. This is not what Judaism is. This is not what it represents and it's actually anti-Semitic to try to claim that a genocide is being carried out in the name of Judaism and the Jewish people. It's Zionism that is anti-Semitic. And what proves that wrong is the Jewish left. Right, right. And uh, listen, you are a journalist and uh, of course um, you are doing a, a great, great job with the uh, breaking through news. Uh, and but my, my question is, uh, um, how is getting more difficult uh, to be a journalist uh, and uh, to be a journalist uh, with some particular ideas uh, and to be an activist against uh, imperialism uh, and against suprematism uh, in this period? Because our sensation, our feeling is that uh, um, the space for free information uh, is uh, diminishing uh, because the um, uh, American unipolar order is getting weaker, uh, we could say, and that's not just our hope, it's a kind of, um, we could say, a diagnosis that we can, uh, we can do right now. But uh, getting weaker also uh, is getting stronger the propaganda and, and is getting stronger the censorships. So, um, what what do you think in the next year we have to uh, we have to wait and expect uh, in the world of uh, free information? I mean, that's a, that's a really big question, and I don't like to uh, to predict things because you know I could be wrong. But I can I can of course uh, speculate and get, and give you my opinion. Um, I mean, look, it's very difficult to be working in independent media with when especially when you're you know very much uh staunchly anti-imperialist uh because you're automatically called many many names you automatically invite it invites harassment it invites attacks also you're being watched right like uh we shouldn't delude ourselves and there's an information war taking place um it's been taking place even before this genocide in gaza you know, 90% of the media in the U.S., for example, is owned by just five or six companies. Um, it's all corporate media, and they all toe the same line uh, on the issues of foreign policy specifically, um, and, the, and especially on the issue of Israel-Palestine. Um, and that's not by accident. That's not a coincidence. That is on purpose, and they are stenographers for the State Department and for the Pentagon. Um, and then those of us in the sort of margins of the media uh, have such an uphill battle because on top of not having the same amount of funding that, you know, big media outlets have uh, where they can really engage in narrative control, we also have to look to um, and depend on these social media uh, companies like YouTube and Facebook and Instagram to promote our content. And that's another uphill battle because those companies are obviously very much 
uh, in bed with the national security state in the U.S., and they're a part of that information war. Um, so, I mean, what all we can do, I mean, what we do at Breakthrough is we try to reach the widest audience possible with all the tools that are at our disposal. I would love for us to have an audience that's like, as big as CNNs, I think that would make a huge difference, in fact, and how people view the world because they're not being told the truth by these major media outlets. Um, but, you know, I think that even though social media is obviously in the hands of the oligarchs and in the hands of the national security state, even then, it's still difficult to suppress the reality of something like Gaza. And that's where a lot of people are getting their information from. I think it's very interesting that when you look at opinions on what's happening in Gaza, if you look at where people are getting their news from, it actually informs what their opinions will likely be. If they're watching CNN and reading the New York Times, they're likely going to have a more pro-Israel perspective. If they're on Instagram and on YouTube and finding outlets, I guess, like Breakthrough News and all this alternative information, and they can follow these people on the ground in Gaza that are giving them the reality really unfiltered, they are very much anti-genocide and they're using that language. So there's no, I don't have an easy answer for this. All we can keep doing is building. We have to be building our own networks, our own outlets with in every way possible. The funding mechanisms are a bit difficult to come across, but you know, we have to have like, and I think we're getting there where we have this like growing patchwork of leftist and anti-imperialist media organizations, independent media organizations around the world. And we're reaching more and more people as people become hungry to understand what's actually going on because they get the sense that they're being lied to. But we're also up against a huge, you know, mountain here as well, because it's also the fact that you have a right wing media apparatus that is very well funded that plays into conspiracy theories that tells people, oh, I'll tell you what you're being lied to about. And they end up capturing the imagination of a lot of people as well. And then kind of, you know, end up pull pulling them down this like right wing rabbit hole. So we've got a lot to compete with. We have like a mainstream corporate media that lies about everything and is pro-imperialist. And then we have a right-wing media, a far-right media, also funded by oligarchs, but that likes to portray itself as being alternative and like, we're going to tell you the truth uh, mm. and sucking people in and away from like the anti-imperialist leftist um, understanding of the world that we're trying to impart on people. Right. And uh, did the did the media, uh, American media, talk about um, Aaron Bushnell? Because uh, in Italy, we, the, we actually just, the, the media, the official, the mainstream, just mentioned this, uh, but uh, uh, have never reported or to the motivation. Uh, so why Aaron Bushnell decided to kill himself? Um, and I don't know, the, the, way, the way the mainstream um, uh, treat this uh, case uh, really shocked me. I don't know how, how did it go in uh, the USA. Yeah, it was similar in the US. I mean, they couldn't not cover it because it's super shocking for somebody to light themselves on fire outside an embassy. That doesn't happen every day. It's a very extreme act of protest and he live streamed it. So there was footage available of exactly what he said. He didn't mince his words. He said this was in protest of the genocide in Gaza. He said, free, free Palestine. And most of the corporate media apparatus in the U.S. tried to bury that. I mean, they had like headlines about, oh, a guy lit himself on fire, a guy killed himself. They tried to blame it on mental illness. Um, it's, I mean, this is a part of narrative control. And for a lot of these outlets, you had to read several paragraphs in before you got to like any quotation of what he actually said and why he did this. Uh, so they're definitely trying to hide, as, as is expected, of what this was actually about because one they don't want to use the word genocide and two they don't want to show that you know at the end of the day this live stream genocide is traumatizing people around the world people are watching this and they're disgusted and horrified and aaron brushnell was disgusted and horrified and he did something about it he did something so extreme about it um for everybody to see and the media basically, I mean, to me, it's basically lying. To omit in the beginning what something was about, to omit his very clear motivation for doing this is a lie. It's lying by omission. Even if you wait four paragraphs, five paragraphs to say what it was, that's not by accident. It's a lie. But they can lie all they want. At the end of the day, people saw the video, people saw what happened, and people relate to those feelings that he had. I mean, maybe you know, people don't want to go light themselves on fire. That is a very extreme act of protest. But 
again, I don't think we should underestimate just how traumatized so many people are around the world, especially in the global north, watching what their governments are doing in Gaza um, and how awakened people are becoming as a result of it. And the New York Times and Time Magazine and all of these outlets can sit there and hide it all they want. Um, but, you know, people are, are in fact seeing the reality of this. Yes, in Italy, they also tried to say that uh, he was just uh, mad, uh, that he had some uh, mental issues. Um, I don't know, really, I mean, fucking bastards. <laughs> I don't have other, other words to describe. <laughs> I mean, you know what? You know what? <laughs> to me it's like if you support genocide after five months of watching this disgusting horror like you're the one with mental issues and yeah. all the people yeah, denying yeah, exactly. it all the people covering up <laughs> for it like there's like they're like so, they're like uh consumed by some sort of collective like psychopathy that i can't quite understand but right, they're so the it's... ones who need their heads checked not not people like aaron brushnell right 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 <laughs> Anyway, um, are you are you in some way alarmed by Trump's probable re-election? Um, direct question, do you actually think that he is worse than uh, Biden? I don't know, it's, it's a very simple and maybe stupid question. But uh, uh, because we have, in Italy, we have the feeling that uh, um, this Biden versus Trump, uh, um, but also re Republicans against Democratic is quite often just a mediatic clash. Also to pretend there that in the USA there is still a democracy and uh, there are, that this is not uh, uh, an oligarchy and that uh, the foreign policy uh, for the 90% doesn't depend uh, on uh, the president. I don't know, what's, um, what's, your, what's your feeling about it? I mean, okay, so it depends where you live. You, mm. If you live in Gaza, they're exactly the same. There's no, I mean, what's worse than genocide? There's no lesser evilism here. Whether it's Biden or Trump, you are still enduring genocide. You are still in hell. You're still in a death camp. Um, and it makes a mockery of all the people who have been mercilessly slaughtered in this genocide to sit here and pretend like there's some massive difference between Biden and Trump. Um, if you live in the U.S., there are definitely some slight differences that maybe matter to people. But again, I want to go back to genocide and what are U.S. lives somehow like more important than the lives of the people in Gaza. Uh, when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to imperialism, there is very little difference between these two parties. It is all about how to maintain US empire because it's a system, not a person. And it's also not a party, by the way. It's a system that maintains regardless of which party is in charge. And there are just slight variations in the ruling class about the best ways to maintain, expand, um, and perpetuate US empire. Um, so when it comes to Biden and Trump, there are some slight differences. For example, you know, if, by, if Trump was president during October 7th, the, there'd be a higher likelihood that this would escalate into a bigger war on Lebanon, for example. That said, we can't rule out that that's what's happening right now under Biden. So this is the kind of conversation, by the way, that we're having when we talk about who's better or worse. We're talking about slight differences that we're just speculating about. At the end of the day, there's very little difference between these two parties, and it's almost like a meaningless conversation to be having because I in no way can sit here and tell people they need to vote for Joe Biden because of Donald Trump, because what is worse than genocide at this point? What is really, what is worse than genocide? No matter which party's in charge, a cold war on China will continue at full speed. No matter which party's in charge, there will be ongoing attempts to undermine all of the countries that stand up to imperialism, whether we're talking about Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, um, Syria, uh, North Korea, uh, Russia, China, like any country that's on the American target list will continue to be targeted by the Americans. It doesn't matter which party is in charge. They're just slight variation in the tactics and strategies that are used. And so it's like a distracting conversation because the conversation I think that we should be having is what do we do about this disgusting anti-democratic system in the U.S. that the entire world is like a slave to, you know? 
Like, why is it that our choices are between genocide and genocide? Like, are we talking about different scales of genocide? Is that where we're at? Because that's not a choice to me. That's a horrible dystopia to me. So the question needs to be about the system and how we change it. Um, and whether Biden or Trump is president next doesn't stop it from chugging along because we're on the same path of Republican than Democrat and Republican than Democrat, more right wing, more right wing. And what I think is a fascistic empire in terms of how the U.S. behaves around the world, that's what we need to be talking about dismantling, not this kind of theatrical conversation about, you know, who's worse, Trump or Biden? I just can't even entertain it anymore. No, no, no. of course, of course, of course. But, uh, um, you know, in, um, um, from Italy and from Europe, we have the, the feeling that um, uh, the word uh, uh, socialism is still a kind of uh, taboo in the USA, even more than here, because actually in Italy, uh, we define ourselves as social democracy, of course, so on. So, so, the, so the, the socialist roots and uh, we recognize it and uh, we are actually very I am actually very proud of it, uh, but uh, it's what actually neoliberalism and also USA imperialism is actually destroying uh, through economy and through hegemony and uh, of course. Um, but uh, yes, do you think that uh, you have hope that uh, in the next uh, in the next years, uh, this anti systemic, uh, this anti systemic uh, uh, different ideology will spread? Maybe with another word, because socialism is not a is not a good uh, is not a good uh, is not a good word. But um, you know, uh, under the concept of anti-imperialism, uh, under the concept of uh, system change, uh, I don't know. What do you think about it? Well, you know, I think that socialism was a much more taboo word before um, the rise of Bernie Sanders in 2016, and then again in 2020. And I'm not you know, holding up Bernie Sanders as like some sort of hero. I'm very angry with him. And it's really unforgivable how he's refused to take a position of, uh, a, a strong position on the genocide in Gaza, which he refuses to call genocide and refused to call for a ceasefire for like the first four months. Um, that said, I mean, the, the word socialism actually did become more popular among younger people in the US. I mean, people under 40, right? The word socialism isn't as taboo. It's people are okay using it. They hate capitalism, which is very important. Um, do they understand what socialism means? Not exactly. <laughs> um, and I think that's where we bump into real problems in the U.S. is that we're sort of like, we're like too, we're, we're in need of, of ideology and, and theory and an understanding of ideology that's against the ones we don't like. Like everyone knows they, they hate capitalism. They increasingly don't like imperialism but they're unclear on an alternative and they don't quite understand what socialism is. And I think that's where outlets like Breakthrough can come in in the sort of educational mm -hmm. aspect of that. But also that's where, you know, politics can play a role in, in terms of like running socialist candidates and elections, especially during moments like this, where people are paying attention to what the alternatives are because they're so disgusted with the status quo. Um, and so that said, I mean, maybe you're right that like anti-imperialism can be the sort of anti-systemic framework that people look at the world through, which ultimately I think does lead to socialism. It is, is socialism. Uh, but I don't know. I'm, listen, I, I, I can do media. Uh, I can't do theory so well, but like there are some academics I could refer to better, but I don't have the best answer to that other than, you know, I keep shouting from the platform I have about how horrible capitalism is, how great socialism is. The, the various examples of it that we have throughout history that still exist today, in fact, um, and how this is like the answer moving forward. Um, sometimes it feels like you're sort of shouting into a black hole, but I hope some people hear it. Um, but I think there are people doing important work. There are political organizations in the U.S. doing important work on educating on this issue. We just need it to happen a little faster. <laughs> right, right, right. And we hope so. We hope so, of course. Um, last last question. Um, do you think that uh, you told us that uh, um, it doesn't have uh, it uh, wouldn't have a lot of uh, consequences uh, for the um, uh, USA foreign policy if uh, Trump uh, will be elected, but maybe uh, a bit the a bit the approach on the Ukrainian war and the approach on China could change um do you think and do you think that uh, trump uh, trump uh, uh, will be more aggressive against china and uh, will try to 
become again a friend with uh, Russia uh, or not? So I do want to push back just for one moment, because I do think there are differences on foreign policy. I mean, the, old, the end goal is the same. The end goal is to maintain and dominate, like it's, it's to maintain American supremacy around the world. It's just they have different strategies for getting there. And it all depends who Trump puts in charge. If we look at the last Trump administration for who he put in charge, it is actually scary because that was people like John Bolton. It was people like Mike Pompeo who was the person who was behind the killing of Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general that almost started a massive war in the Middle East. Um, and it was, you know, people like Marco Rubio, who he put in charge of like Latin American policy. Uh, and that was a disaster. I mean, that's where we saw the, the, the Juan Guaido coup attempt. I mean, that happened under Donald Trump. Um, so there are some slight differences. You know, Donald Trump's administration at the time, because he said nice things about Putin and there was this whole Russiagate thing, that was all a lie. Um, because of all that, there was this constant narrative in the media that Trump is pro-Russia. But actually, if you look at the policies of the Trump administration, he broke all of the treaties that America had with Russia, which was incredibly dangerous. Uh, and he laid the foundation for what was the um, what became the Biden policy, especially after the the war in Ukraine started. Um, so I think that you would actually see a continuation of that war under Trump, um, not an end to it, because while Trump might say some anti-war things, he doesn't really mean them. What matters is who he puts in charge. And also Trump demonstrated during his last administration that he's not willing to actually stand up against any of these wars that he claims to be against. Uh, under a Trump administration, I think you would see a continuation of the aggressiveness towards China, which I think you saw during the Biden administration. I think with Trump, it might be ramped up a little bit more. Um, and I'm sure that, listen, I'm sure that countries like China and Cuba uh, are well aware that these variations to them do matter a little bit, right? Because it gives them a little bit more breathing room if a Democrat that sort of like is a little less, um, you know, neoconservative when it comes to how they treat, you know, adversary countries or enemy countries is in charge versus a neoconservative Republican administration that's gonna just see everything as a nail and take a hammer to it. So I do, I do think that that's maybe the difference in foreign policy between Democrats and Republicans is Republicans just wanna like, you know, tear down everything all at once, whereas Democrats have a bit of a more like almost effective strategy in a way that's like long-term. But again, end goal is the same. So I do think that a Trump administration probably would take a, a more aggressive rhetorical approach, uh, a more aggressively rhetorical approach and a more racist approach, like openly racist uh, against adversary countries than you saw with the US. But again, I want to remind everyone, the end goal is the same. And really, when it comes to American policy, foreign policy, we have to look at the fact that if you look at this that last several decades, it's really just a ping pong, like back and forth, like a tennis match between Republicans and Democrats, where it's Democrats in charge and the Republicans in charge and the Democrats in charge and the Republicans in charge. So the policy is maintaining itself. Sometimes it's a little bit more aggressive. Sometimes it's slightly less aggressive, but equally as destructive. Um, and I, I'm sorry if that sounds confusing, but again, um, yes, I do think that a Trump administration might be more aggressive, uh, but I, same end goal, same end goal. And for some people in certain parts of the world, it won't make yeah. a single bit of a difference. Yes, that shouldn't be our, our focus, of course, of course. Rania, thank you, thank you very much for uh, for this conversation and for uh, being with us. We we really enjoyed it, and uh, thank you, thank you all the listeners. Uh, see you in the next episodes. Bye, Rania. Thank you again. Thank you.